I think this works. Victor? Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, I'm still having trouble adjusting to a hybrid world, so I never really know who I'm talking to. Uh, but hello to those of you who are watching in Zoom land, and, to the, and hello to those of you who are here uh, at the Institute for Public Knowledge. I'm Eric Kleinenberg. I'm the director of the IPK, uh, where we do a lot of conversations like these. Um, people who are inside the academy uh, trying to engage both uh, other scholars and also people outside the university and, and broaden conversations. And uh, this is a really uh, terrific uh, book for our series and uh, for broader conversations. Uh, it's um, by Frank Dobbin, who's here tonight, and Alexandra Kalev. It's called Getting to Diversity, What Works and What Doesn't. Um, and Frank, you and I haven't spoken that much about this particular book, but when I was reading it, it became clear to me that this is genuinely a book that's uh, based on decades of scholarship that has uh, an enormous amount of hard-won findings, but that's also very clearly for people who care about you know, getting diversity right and getting organizations right. Um, it seems to me like it's in incredibly practical um, and is the kind of thing that um, will spark conversations in a lot of different places, probably most importantly um, in organizations that are trying to do better uh, and in policy circles uh, in communities that really care about this problem. And, and the problem is that the, the pathways to managerial careers uh, are blocked for, for, for most people. Uh, we still have uh, corporate organizations, large private sector organizations that do the lion's share of hiring um, that routinely fail to uh, r recruit people from all walks of life, to nurture careers once people get there, uh, to provide pathways to uh, positions of responsibility and authority and of higher levels of compensation, and re resulting uh, in uh, uh, the problem of inequality being compounded uh, far more than it needs to be. And um, the, uh, the, there, there's much to say about um, the substance, but I'm gonna let the author do that. So tonight we're really lucky to have um, Frank Dobbin here. Um, Frank is the Chair of Sociology at Harvard. I have a little cheat sheet to say a, a bit more. He's the Henry Ford II Professor of the Social Sciences uh, and also the author of you know, s several books and uh, scores of articles uh, on this issue. Uh, everyone who knows this field has relied on Frank's work for, for a long time and uh, it's, it's really fun to see the, this book come together in this way. It's, it's really kind of an exciting piece of, of scholarship. Um, we're going to ask Frank to speak for about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, summarizing the book. And then we have two terrific uh, discussants before we open up into a conversation between people in this room and also those of you who are online will give you a chance to ask questions as well. Um, my colleague, Maria Abascal, it says here, Assistant Professor of Sociology at NYU. I think that title's not going to be good for much longer. So, um, uh, Maria, uh, her research um, is, a, is about ethno-racial diversity and diversification. She is an extraordinary experimental researcher and also uses the, the surveys. She's a new-ish colleague of mine, uh, and I'm really thrilled to have you at IPK. We gotta get you here more often. Uh, and then we have Valerie Purdy uh, Greenaway, who's the director for the Laboratory of Intergroup Relations and the Social Mind at Columbia University. She's associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Columbia. Oh. Full professor. All the titles are changing tonight. I'm proud to announce that Frank is now emeritus. <laughs> Everybody gets a promotion here. <laughs> That's great. It's not on my cheat sheet. Um, but uh, in keeping with the theme of tonight's conversation, it's appropriate that we uh, make sure that everybody is, is given the proper uh, title. So professor of the Department of Psychology at Columbia, core faculty, um, uh, I don't even know if this is still true. The Robert Wood Johnson Health and Societies Program, does that still exist? Uh, but also now uh, part of the business school at Columbia. And it's really nice to have you downtown at IPK. Uh, we'd like to get you here more too. So um, no more from me. Uh, Frank, uh, thank you so much for making the trip down here. We're really excited to have you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Eric. And I'm so grateful to have two of the people I'm, um, who I am the biggest fans of, I think. Um, Valerie and Maria here to discuss the book. Um, 
So I've been studying diversity programs for a long time, and um, in the beginning I was studying the diffusion of different programs, why different things diffused. And then maybe 20 years ago, I just was so frustrated with seeing the diffusion of things that nobody thought would work in the social sciences that people were very skeptical of. And that's, that's when Sandra Kalev and I started on this project of really trying to get data that would allow us to look at what works and what doesn't and what actually backfires. And that's what this book is about. It's bringing together a lot of interviews and quantitative um, data that we've assembled over the years to try to figure out which things are actually moving the needle and in particular why the needle is moving so slow. So I show you this slide to show how slow the needle is moving. If you look at the corporate workforce in America, a lot of firms have some high profile women and people of color in top jobs. And so if you compare com companies, especially at the top, to 30 years ago, they just looked dramatically more diverse. So it looks like people are making progress. It looks that way in academia as well. Everyone can point to some people of color on their faculties, sometimes very few people of color on their faculties, but some, whereas 30 years ago, often they couldn't point to any. But this shows um, not whether there are a few scattered people of color and white women in management jobs, it shows the likelihood you are, over time, to be in management if you're from one of these eight groups, if you're working anywhere in corporate America. So if you are, are if you look at the bottom line, if you're a black woman in corporate America, what are the, what are the chances you will have a, a management job? In 1985, if you look at the bottom green line, you'll see that about 4% of black women in all of corporate America were managers of some sort, low level mostly, but they were in management. If you look at 2018, that had risen to 5%. Um, Latinx women are, have made a little bit more progress. They were also at 4% in 1985, um, and now they're closer to 6%. Uh, black men and Latinx men were at 6 and 7% in 1984 about, and in 2018, they're still at six and seven percent. So you can, you can find more people of color in corporate America, mostly because there's been immigration from the Caribbean, from Africa, from Latin America. You can find more Asian Americans in corporate America as well. But at least for blacks and Latinos, the chance that that uh, if you're in corporate America, that you'll be a manager has barely changed. And it, it will be literally hundreds of years for these two groups of women before they achieve parity with white men at this rate. And for the, these two groups of men, they'll never achieve parity. We've made no progress in the last 35 years. So that's the problem we've been trying to address. And I think, I think you kind of have to stare at how bad it is and companies look at their own numbers all the time, so, or they should be, so they know. So I really want to um, get across three messages today. And I want to point out that um, the findings we have here for corporations are paralleled by our, our new project on universities, where we t take data from 600 large colleges and universities over about 25 years and find very slow progress. And we also find that the most common diversity programs backfire. And they're the same programs that backfire in, um, in corporate America. And they are, um, and, and the programs that work are the same kinds of programs that work in corporate America. So what we do is we, um, we track federal data on corporate diversity. We do this in the universities project too, at the organization level by job rank. So I'm going to talk only about what changes the diversity in management today. So the way we run these models is we, we retrospectively look at what programs companies had over time. So in this case, what happens um, when you put in a legalistic diversity training for managers? 
what happens over about eight to 10 years on average. And what we're seeing here is that this, and this is the most common form of training, it has negative effects. It have, has negative effects on um, five of the seven historically disadvantaged groups. So when, in these slides, wherever you see a bar, it means that we find a significant effect, positive or negative. And where there's no bar, where there's just a placeholder, it means we don't find a statistically significant effect. But you can see from the pattern here that legalistic diversity training for managers isn't working. The problem is that we've been trying to treat bias in individual managers' heads. We've been thinking that that's the problem that we need to address. And so one solution is this legalistic diversity training for managers. So how does that work? Well, it starts with implicit bias training that's designed to prove to individuals that they are biased. That doesn't sit well with people. People don't want to be told that they're bigots. They don't want you to try to convince them that they're bigots. It angers people. And we've, we see in a lot of exit surveys from diversity tra training seminars that they don't respond well. The second part of this kind of diversity training is that it focuses on the law. So first you're told you're biased, and then you're told, here's a list of things you can't do if you're a manager. And these are all things that if you're a manager, you have been doing. So the goal is to prove to you that you're biased and that you're actually discriminating. Managers react negatively to this. They go away pissed and they, they are not converted to the, to the project of trying to promote diversity in their own workforces. Companies also try to go after individual bias with HR rules. This is the effect of one of them. A lot of firms in the 90s put in job tests for managers with the idea that this is a way, if you require hiring managers to give people job tests, it's a way for you to get, um, to, to prevent them from, uh, from exercising bias when they're hiring people. So these are job tests for managers, people applying to management positions. And here we see that for all seven historically disadvantaged groups, there are big negative effects afterwards. So you put in these job tests and they don't increase diversity in management, they reduce diversity significantly. Why is that? People like to try to get around rules and so when managers are faced with these job tests, they try to circumvent the rule of choosing people on the basis of the test. So they will routinely, manage, hiring managers will routinely appoint a manager, tell him he got the job, and then subsequently give some other people tests and then tell them they didn't get the job. The tests are never transparent, people don't know their scores. So the tests become a way to say, for managers to say to the people they don't want to hire, sorry, there was a problem with the test. So that's an example of a kind of HR rule that clearly backfires, a rule that's designed to try to root out uh, discrimination. Another way that firms try to root out discrimination is with civil rights grievance procedures. So he here's an approach that is, seems unlikely on the face of it to work. This is a threat that if you're a manager who discriminates, you'll be brought to trial in an internal proceeding in your organization. So we see negative effects for these. And why do, why do we see negative effects? I think there are three parts to that. People who file grievances almost always face retaliation, and the most likely outcome of filing a grievance is that you have to leave your job because of the retaliation. Sometimes the retaliation takes the form of a demotion. Sometimes it takes the form of verbal insults in the office. So, so people face retaliation, and after, a f after that's happened a few times, everyone else learns not to file complaints. So if you go to HR in your universities and say you're thinking of filing a complaint, I guarantee they will counsel you out of that. As a consequence, executives look at the complaint data and they say, nobody's filing complaints. We don't have a problem. We don't have any more work to do. What's discouraging is grievance procedures, um, diversity training, 
These are the things that organizations uniformly have in place. And they uniformly have some kinds of rules to try to prevent um, discrimination. So those are some things that don't work that are very popular. And now I'll turn to some things that do work that are not so popular. What the pattern we see is that efforts to democratize every aspect of the career system are much more effective. So opening up all parts of the career system to everyone. Now, when I say this to, to executives, they, are, they say, we have a meritocratic firm, we have processes in, in place to make sure that the best people get promoted, there is no discrimination. But behind that meritocracy, there is, for example, when it comes to recruitment of, um, of new uh, college grads, or when it comes to recruitment of lateral recruitment of mid-career managers, people use, when it comes to new college grads, they go to historically white colleges. Most firms don't go to historically black colleges or Latinx serving institutions. Here, we're just looking at whether firms responded positively to, we have some kind of targeted recruitment system, whether it means we go to the New York Black MBA Association meetings, or we go to Morehouse and Howard to recruit people. Any kind of targeted recruitment like that that specifically searches for, um, for groups that are historically underrepresented seems to have significant positive effects on the subsequent diversity of managers. So for the things that work, they tend to work by changing how the career system works so that in this case, different kinds of people are actively recruited, but also by getting managers involved. So instead of training managers in diversity, trying to show them they're biased, the things that work get managers to learn to support people from different groups, and they also get managers to interact more with people from different groups. One of the problems that we see with white male managers is they literally don't know any of the black people in their firm because they're segmented in other departments. Um, they never run across them. Um, they might be in HR or logistics rather than in finance. Um, so one way to, to do that, to make managers part of the solution and to expand their networks by exposing them to people from different groups is targeted recruitment. Another way is a formal mentoring program. So the problem with mentoring in most places is that it's informal. And when it's informal, people choose protégés who look like them too often. A formal mentoring program just, especially if it's open to everybody, it just allows anybody to ask for a mentor all the way up and down the organization. And what we see in, these, in, in the introduction of these programs is that women and people of color disproportionately ask to have a mentor because they disproportionately don't have mentors. Often when these programs are off offered to white men, their response is, I've got too many mentors. I don't need a mentoring program. Whereas women and people of color are signing up. And here we're seeing some very positive effects of just creating a formal mentoring program open to everyone. One of the disappointing things with the latest fad in formal mentoring is it's for high potentials, which means people who have already been fast-tracked and identified as stars, and not for people who don't have a mentor or a sponsor. Creating new formal training programs is also a way to open up another part of the career system. A lot of training happens informally when a manager takes somebody aside, takes somebody who they think could be a supervisor aside, shows them how to do payroll or shows them in a retail store how to do inventory. Um, and we look at a bunch of different kinds of training programs from supervisors and they all have positive effects. They all promote, um, promote diversity in, in the ranks of management. Cross-training, um, I think is a cool example because the way it works is management prospects come in to a firm and they usually get rotated around through, say, six departments for two months each. 
So if you're coming into HR, which is mostly, which is feminized, you get rotated through other departments. Um, so you get experience in other departments, you see how the work is done, they see you, and the managers in those departments are responsible for training you. So they are training people who don't look like their normal employees. They're training people from other segregated departments. And this has nice positive effects on almost all historically underrepresented groups. So now I'm a, I want to talk about work-life programs and the, the, the broad effects they have. Work-life programs are another part of the career system. They're a part of the career system that helps people find their way through challenges, usually when they have young children or old parents. And um, what we began to see in interviewing people is that, so when you talk to HR managers, and you talk about, to them about racial diversity programs and gender diversity programs, they, to a person, say, oh, work life is for white ladies. It's just for white ladies. They're the people who care about this. Um, but if you think about who would benefit from work life programs, the people who have some of the, the toughest financial challenges at work, when they have young children or aging parents, are people of color because they have less wealth than white people. So usually both parents or both people in a couple with aging parents have to keep working. So nobody can take six months off or a year off and then go back to another job. So what happens when people face challenges and they don't have work-life supports is that they quit and they look for another job that's more flexible, that's closer to home, that allows them to bring their child to work part-time. So this is just the effect of putting in a flex time policy. A flex time policy doesn't cost anything. It just allows you to go to your supervisor and say, I'm gonna need to work four long days and have Fridays off for six months. Or I'm gonna need to, wor to work from 5 a.m. for eight hours instead of coming in at 9 a.m. And it allows them to ask, at least. And here we see pretty significant positive effects for all seven historically disadvantaged groups. Parental leave policy. This is, so flex time policy, the one that I outlined, doesn't cost anything. Parental leave policy. So everybody has a right to ask for a parental leave under federal law since 1993. Here we just ask, is there a, system for asking. Is there a policy on the books? And is it explained how you would ask for this? And often, often you can click through the, um, the HR page and figure out where to put in, I want to take a parental leave for these months. Just having a formal process makes it clear to people that you can do this, you can have a leave. And we, we see that if, the, if companies actually off, offer um, income replacement during leaves, there are even stronger positive effects on, on diversity. And here's a child care referral program. In all these cases, I'm showing you the cheapest version of each program. This isn't on-site child care. This is, do you have a list, usually online, often updated, for what places in the neighborhood of the, of the workplace have um, child care spots available for children at different ages. Just, just putting that online signals to people, and this is what we hear in our interviews, I knew then that I could talk to my manager about the problem I was having. It was legit to go to them and try to get them to help me. So, I mean, these days, you can, this, child, you can look this up. This is Googleable for by neighborhood. Um, but all of these things, although they don't cost anything, they send, a, they send an important signal. Of course, paying for childcare is even more effective. And the last point I want to make is that, um, and this goes to something I said before, that when companies put managers in charge of this, instead of outsourcing it to consultants, or segmenting and siloing it in a diversity, equity, and inclusion office, 
they change the dynamic of how, how these things work, how opening up career system work, systems work in particular, because they make that, that work the work of managers themselves. And one of the problems with, um, that we see in some of the social psychological research on diversity programs is that people think it's somebody else's job and if there's something going on somewhere else in the organization, they think, it's, they think the problem is taken care of and they don't have to worry about it. So two things really seem to work um, to get managers to think they're in charge. One is establishing and publicizing workforce diversity goals. So these are pretty solid effects just from saying, here's the goal. We are 38% women in management. We want to be 45 in six years. We are 1% African Americans in management. We want to be 3% in six years. Um, the goals are often not that ambitious, but they are, if they're ambitious enough that they're going to be hard to get to, managers start, managers manage toward goals. There's, they manage toward cost reduction or sales expansion. Um, so these seem to work, these seem to work well. And this is arguably the best thing you can do. And I think this works because, well, a diversity task force does three things. It brings together managers, usually the CEO asks department heads to either be on, on this task force or to send somebody, a lieutenant, to be on the task force. They brainstorm for solutions, so they come up with ideas. So they'll look at the data. They, they'll look at the data from the HR information system. What are promotion rates by division for people from different demographic groups? Which are the problem groups? Why is that happening? And what do we need? Is it work-life programs? Are we failing on mentoring? Do we need more skill training, supervisor training? And then they go back and put them into place. So those people on the task force become the people who make their own departments accountable. It's not somebody in HR who's coming in to say, why isn't anybody going to recruit at Howard this year from your department? It's the VP, or it's the VP's right-hand person. You know, when you look at the pattern, I feel like it's not that hard to generalize, to think beyond like what kinds of strategies would work and what kinds wouldn't work. It's clear that what we're doing which is betting on efforts to fight bias in individuals, it just doesn't work, it backfires. It's worse than doing nothing. Um, but we see any efforts to democratize career systems and open them up to everybody seems to have positive effects. And pretty quickly, and what we're seeing in the data is they're sustained, they don't come and go. We see, because we, we can look up to 20 years out in firms and Everything I've shown you, if it has a positive effect, it's still working 20 years later. So, you know, often people, like if, we, if you take the Rooney Rule, people argue, yeah, the Rooney Rule looked like it worked for two years, and then it went, its effects went away. So the NFL has two black coaches now, just as it did before they adopted the Rooney Rule. Um, these things, everything I've talked about that is po has a positive effect, they all have sustained effects, and it's not like they bring people in and then they disappear after two years. And finally, just putting managers in charge seems the right way to get, go get it going. Essentially, companies need, and universities as well, they need to institutionalize the, different, the changes so that career systems are just open, in, are structurally open in as many ways as they can be. Um, and then they need to make managers in charge of the ongoing updating of these systems so that they're not, they're not thinking somebody else is going to come in and look at this and try to solve the problem. Well, thank you so much for being here, and I really can't thank you two enough for agreeing to be on the panel. This one's on. <laughs> Um, I am so excited to be here and to talk about this book. Um, it was a lot of fun to read. Um, 
And I just want to note, for those of you who haven't read it yet, that Frank and his co-author clearly put a lot of effort into writing a book that's accessible to a lot of people. And it really shows. Um, the prose is really clear. Um, the figures like the ones that you saw in the presentation today, Frank and Alexandra, they don't show non-significant bars, which is, I just thought, genius. Like, that's so good for presentations and for writing for wider audiences. Um, and so really for the last two weeks as I've been making my way through the book, getting to diversity has been like my conversation piece at dinner parties and in family text threads. Um, because so many of the people I know, like all of you, they work somewhere. And so they have firsthand experience with and a lot of opinions about anti-bias training, about performance reviews, about work, life, and family leave policies. Um, one of the things that shocks people, and I'm wondering, Frank, if you have this experience when you tell people about your research, especially non-social scientists, is how many of the interventions that don't work are in place at their workplaces, right? And um, I want to highlight, you make this very clear in the book, but I'm not sure you kind of uh, drove this home in this presentation. It's not just that these things don't work, it's that these things actually reduce diversity uh, among managers. Um, and they're also surprised by how few of the interventions that do work that we have solid evidence for are actually in place. Um, just to quote my sister in our family text thread, uh, this is after I sent a screenshot of a graph from the book. Um, I feel like I gotta tell someone, but I don't know who. Uh, my sister works in healthcare, her boyfriend works in finance, and his response was, it's so crazy to me that nobody knows this. Um, I'm not convinced, of course, that no one knows this. Um, and um, that this is the reason anti-bias trainings are ubiquitous and family leave policies aren't. Um, and I think I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about what the obstacles are to putting what you know into practice and how to go about affecting change. Um, so related to that, as you mentioned in the book, Supreme Court decisions have suggested companies, uh, have suggested that companies that have harassment training programs might be uh, not liable for harassment. Right. This makes me even more skeptical uh, you know, of my uh, sister's boyfriend's claim that the issue is simply that managers don't know what works and that the solution is just to let them know, is to you know, send out copies of your book to all of them. And I'm wondering how you think about making sure that the important findings actually change how companies approach diversity. So I think the question about obstacles is really kind of the flip side of your earlier work on you know, why do things diffuse? Well, why do things not diffuse as well, and what can we do about it? Um, related to that, I also wanted to talk uh, about uh, the war on what conservatives are calling now critical race theory, which is led by Christopher Rufo, who on his website in his uh, critical race theory briefing book calls out companies like Verizon, Lockheed Martin, Bank of America, American Express, Google, CVS, Walmart, Raytheon, and others um, for having anti-bias training programs. Um, and of course, Rufo's goal and that of conservatives um, who are aligned with him, they're, they go way beyond getting rid of anti-bias training programs. And I'm wondering, in your perspective, if the current moment is presenting unique challenges for implementing programs that actually work to promote uh, workplace diversity and how we might overcome them. Um, I also finally want to zoom in on one specific intervention you touched on this a little bit in the presentation, and one that we saw a lot of following uh, Black Lives Matter protests in 2020. And these are interventions um, that involve making workforce composition numbers public, um, which often goes hand in hand with uh, setting diversity goals, as you mentioned. Uh, you acknowledge in your book that it's too early to know whether public goal setting uh, works, but results from previous goal setting initiatives seem promising. Um, it seems to me that one major challenge is for organizations to decide how they know when they've actually achieved diversity, which is no small feat because this requires that organizations actually settle on what they mean by diversity in the first place. So some of my own work is on what people mean by this term diversity. Um, and one of the things that worries me is the extent to which people who have the incentive to do so including managers, can stretch the term in really outlandish ways. So, you know, in one paper by David Embrick, uh, with interviews of managers of Fortune 1000 companies, 
you know, you have some managers who are describing diversity as, quote, bringing your dog to work, and others saying diversity is about wearing flip-flops on Fridays. Um, you know, it seems to support what Clarence Thomas said in the recent Supreme Court hearing two weeks ago for Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina, where he said, quote, I've heard the word diversity quite a few times, and I don't have a clue what it means. It seems to mean everything for everyone. Um, but I disagree with Thomas, uh, not just on this issue, and that's because my own research, and that of quite a few others actually, really uncovers a remarkable consensus across Americans in terms of what diversity means as long as they don't have an incentive to define it in a certain way. And if that's the case, first and foremost, people associate diversity primarily with race and in workplaces, probably also with gender. Um, and second, we know that rank matters and that people rate organizations with uh, similar compositions as being more diverse when racial minorities and, women's are, and women are distributed across the ranks and not limited to typically lower level roles. Um, so all of this is to say that, you know, I agree that public goal setting is one way forward. I just want to add that it's not only because it keeps organizational organizations accountable when it comes to assessing whether they meet their numbers, but it also, it keeps them honest when it comes to the goals that they set in the first place, because the public that can see these goals doesn't have the same incentive to distort the meaning of diversity that managers might. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Valerie, and uh, I'm going to start with the story of how I heard about this book. So I'm a professor of psychology um, way, way uptown in the land of the Upper West Side. <laughs> and um, uh, one of the things that I do is I'm very interested in the, in the spread of scientific evidence, particularly related to DEI. Um, but in any case, I got a fancy promotion this uh, past year and was asked to teach the first ever course at Columbia Business School, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Organizations. And actually, one of my students is here today, Josie, so, um, and not for extra credit, so thank you so much for coming. So it's August, it's hot. I'm in the brand new Columbia Business School uh, building, which is made out of glass, so it's really hot. And I am sitting on the top floor with a stack of 25 of Frank's papers because I'm trying to, I had put the syllabus together and I wanted to use the corpus of his knowledge to talk about um, organizational drivers of DEI. I knew that th this was the person, this is, this is the work. I've known uh, Frank and Alexandra for a very long time. And um, I'm really um, working hard to get through all of these papers because they're very, very long and they're very, very detailed. And you can pull out many of the themes that Frank is talking about here. Um, and literally, kind of right, right at that moment, I believe, maybe the day after, I get an email from um, Frank uh, sort of talking about this book. So I immediately um, buy the book. I then email the, you know, the editor. I'm like, how do I get this book? Like, right now, I need this, this second. Like, please, I need this. I, I bought four copies on four different websites so it could be rushed word to my house. And then I was sent um, an electronic copy. And I say that because um, there's sort of several things that are important in this book. It's a well known that if you want to know what works and has for a very long time with a continuous data set, this this is the this is the shop. This is the this is the person to go to, but but to then add a um, legal scope. So there's quite a bit about legal jur jurisprudence in there. How does it interweave with regulatory policies over time? You get the rich texture of managers and stories, and and that's all part of it. And all of these are part of very different papers. And then to, so so to have it all in one book, I think is incredibly important. Um, one of the things that I've done over the course of putting this class together is I've read at least 70 different books. I can't tell you how many books there are out there on, on, on DEI. They're, they're quite a bit. Um, but what I think is compelling about this particular book is by having a continuous data set, you can tell a continuous and reliable story. And it's quite fascinating when you look at other books that might be pulling from a study here or pulling from a study there, and then you could actually cherry pick a story that's compelling. And, and that does not happen in, in this book. 
Um, the other thing that happens in this book, which I think is really, really interesting, is that you get to see a nice story about the relationship between the, the law, so that the rise of affirmative action policies, the decline of affirmative action policies, and then organizational responses to those. And, and, and so you can start to see sort of this, this symbiosis between the law, between how businesses respond to the, to the law and then what happens over the time. So there are a lot of things that are part of this book that go far beyond the what works um, to really thinking about um, deep organizational theory in a way that's, that's accessible. So I, I found this book really exciting. And, and the other thing is, is that there is a what works. There, there is a there there that I want to reflect on. Um, so I think there's sort of three points that I, that I wanted to uh, make that I think are important. I'm not sure if I have a question per se, but I'd love to hear you reflect on this. And one is I'm, I'm trained as a, as a psychologist. So one of the things that I constantly think about is um, the importance of psychology. So not so much just what works, but um, what are managers' experiences um, that make them feel that diversity is worth something that that's doing. And that sort of relates to um, one of Frank's last points. And I think there are some really important lessons in this book um, about the marriage between um, psychology as it gets integrated into what, what works. And, and what I mean by that is that the book talks a lot about agency and choice. And one of the things that I hear a lot of managers talk about, and one of those people that I have a little baby consulting firm, and I'm in and out of firms when they can't figure out what works. And I'm like, well, just read one of Frank's papers. Um, and so, um, but one of the things that, that happens is um, managers say things like they have diversity fatigue. And managers say things like, you know, um, you know, they're, they're tired of being told what to do and they sort of liken diversity um, um, activities and initiatives to, you know, being at the library with an old librarian that's like sort of telling them what to do and they sort of conjure up these images that um, are about um, resistance, like I don't want to and should I have to. But when you make DEI agentic, when you give people choice, when you allow people's creativity and ingenuity to come alive, which is what managers love to do, now equity is exciting. Now equity is part of leadership. And now equity is something that people buy into. And that becomes very clear, I think, in, in this book. And that, that's about, it's not just agency, but you know, innovation and creativity and allowing managers not just take responsibility, but, but turn it into something that's fun and exciting. I think the second thing that's in, important is that in illuminating what works, this book also illuminates that the reason why things are hard is because the same thing doesn't work for every group under every condition at all times. And you can see that in each of these graphs and each of these models. Um, and the effects vary as a function of intersectionality um, effects. And so what that means is that as a manager, as a leader, you have to do something different. You can't just read the book and wholesale implement everything in this book. That also will not work. What, what you need to do is you need to look at the demographics of your company because it's the foundation of who's there and who's not. You then have to focus on the challenges that they face. Some of them will overlap with some of the things in this book, some of them may not. And, and then you can use this book as a set of hypotheses about what works around not just democratized networks, but how are you going to do it in your particular context? And then you need to kind of you know, do your own due diligence and study. So I think this, this is, is not just a what works, but a model of how. And, and the last thing that I want to end with is that the word democratize, you see this quite frequently throughout, throughout the book. And I think that's a powerful frame because it moves us beyond disadvantage and privilege to the idea that certain people are having experiences, they're having referrals, they're having mentors, they're having sponsors. These are activities that are already happening and they just need to be opened up to everyone. So um, those are my comments and um, it's an amazing uh, book and uh, I'm buying a copy for all of the students in my class and because uh, it's just that worthwhile to have, so thank you. Okay, so I think, um, Frank, there are a few questions there for you um, in, the, in, in these comments. So if there's anything you want to respond to, um, you could do that before we open it up. I guess the kind of picking up on this last point on uh, the democratizing idea, it struck me that one of the, the key concepts in your book 
is this idea of a career system. And the career system is posed against the idea of bias as being the, 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 the driving force. And so, although clearly this book has ideas about um, choice and agency, um, there is a bit of an opposition between a sociological approach to thinking about uh, diversity in the workplace and a more psychologized, psychologized approach which says the problem is the, the bias that managers carry into this or that firms carry. So I wonder if before we jump into a bigger conversation and while you address anything that came up here, if you like, you could say a little bit more about the idea of a career system and what it means to democratize that um, and the kind of grip on uh, corporate programs that psychologizing explanations seem to have. Well, I think most HR managers would tell you that they have a career system and they can identify all the parts of it. The career st system involves how they recruit people, how they nurture them, how they give them skills, how they retain them when they have outside offers, how they promote them, and how they help them work through work-life challenges they have, especially to, to encourage retention of the people they want to keep. And um, I think we don't think that way enough about how firms operate. And what I find interesting is when I talk to, to people who, managers who served on uh, diversity task forces, they start to get a holistic view of there are these important points where you can lose people. And you know, a lot of the problems with our career system is, a, is that there's just differential attrition of people from different groups because black people leave because they don't think they can get ahead and because they don't see anybody like themselves above them and they, and they see patterns of discrimination where in finance no black people end up on the key teams that are, that are trying to make the, the high profile deals and so they don't get the experience that will allow them in a conventional investment, uh, a convention, conventional investment bank to move up. So um, I do think that there is a kind of tension between this kind of psychologizing of the problem and the real structural obstacles that people face. What I think is um, a real challenge is executives, they came up through the system. They think it was meritocratic. They don't want to be told that there's something wrong with it, that it's mm. blocking access for some people. And so it's hard for them to see when you say you don't recruit at historically black colleges, that's where the black students are. They don't see, they say, oh, you know, there's some black students at every college. But if you want to, if you're not a attracting enough black uh, college students, you, you have to go to historically black colleges. So, um, Can I just say a couple of words? Yeah, in, please. In response yeah, to this. So thank you yeah. both. Um, I think I feel like uh, Valerie, you just m made some of the key points in the book much better than I made them. <laughs> so, thank you. I, I was I, I tried to take. If you're uh, going to France, I'll go with you. I tried to take, <laughs> I tried to take verbatim notes so that I can um, use your framing uh, next time around. Uh, Maria, but you you pose I think challenging questions, Maria. I mean, we are at a at a point where there's a war on critical race theory. And I mean, this, this also goes to Valerie's point about what, what managers call diversity fatigue. They're just tired of it not working and them not knowing what to do. Um, there are a lot of things in here that are not really diversity programs. A, a mentoring program is not really a diversity program. And most most people in organizations don't see work-life programs as racial diversity programs, but they are. I mean, across the board, they, they, every policy we look at promotes not only women of color and white women, but men of color, all of the work-life programs. So I, I do think there are a bunch of things that companies can do when they have resistant managerial workforces that will change things, well, like job rotation. A lot of firms are doing job rotation for various reasons, and um, it clearly 
cr changes people's networks, gives people new, people new skills, especially women and people of color, and helps them move into management in different departments. So I'm not saying that you sh we should cave into the critics of critical race theory or the, you know, when they're, or the right wing, but w when I talk to managers in different companies, the fact is there are some companies where managers will resist every single move that looks like a diversity move, yeah. but a mentoring program doesn't look like it. So I think that's, um, I think that's one solution. Um, you know, you, you talk about, about whether setting goals is gonna be effective. Um, your discussion of Clarence Thomas is interesting because um, Lauren Edelman, and this, this, well I think what, Lauren Edelman years ago talked about um, how we, uh, she's a law professor at Berkeley, how we define diversity too broadly and when we define it to mean everything, like what sports you like, um, we lose the, re the real critical focus on race and then gender. And I think your own work is terrific in showing that people understand what diversity is. It does not mean diversifying the front line. It means racial diversity all the way up and down the ranks. And it means gender diversity all the way up and down. And I think that's very encouraging because it's not like people really don't know. They, there's motivated reasoning of managers when they, when they start to say, they start to, to list characteristics of diversity like childless or not um, that really should not be part of the equation. All right, let's open it up. Jane? Oh, well, thanks. Thanks, for, thanks, Frank, for the book, and thanks for the panel. Um, very, very stimulating uh, discussion. Um, I'm a former, uh, I'm a retired NYU professor, and uh, in the last few years of teaching here, of course, I experienced many of the programs that you find both effective and ineffective. Um, lots of HR testing, lots of bad advice, it seems to me, and then we have, but in the history department, diversity task force. Um, hard to, anal uh, to really think about empowering the managers. I like to think about empowering the professors. But um, my question is the following. Uh, it seems to me when I read your, your comments and some of the earlier work, uh, <laughs> and perhaps this is a negative reading on my part, but the real enemy is HR. I mean, these are the people who in our lives seem to intrude the most with the testing and so on. Um, and telling us what to do in so many aspects of our teaching, uh, including diversity. So um, I'd like you to say a little bit more about um, the whole phenomenon of the expansion of HR um, a staff at universities I know best, prob probably companies as well. And uh, two questions. Um, first of all, how diverse are the HR staffs themselves in general, if you've done work on that, and then how to deal with the fact that there are a lot of people who are invested in the testing, in the instructional um, aspects of um, diversity that you find actually so negative uh, in terms of their results. Well, you know, HR, um, there's good data from the census and from the BLS on what, what HR managers look like, HR managers and staff. And they, they used to be, in the early 60s, it was all white men and they were anti-labor. So they were basically there to fight unions. And it pretty quickly, I mean, labor unions went down in the corporate world and, and diversity, um, equal opportunity laws expanded. So pretty quickly, they were mostly women increasingly black and brown women in diversity positions. I think it's, I think it's a, it is a problem that it is HR that is promoting a lot of the programs that are ineffective, but I don't think, I don't think the, the people promoting them do it with malice. I think they just, they've, they've been trying what executives will accept. So I think the problem is, it's, it's demand rather than supply, because when I talk to HR managers who are in charge of diversity programs or not, they'll say, here's what I want to do. 
and they'll want to do the right things, but, and then they'll say, but the CEO won't let me do it. So I'm stuck doing a different version of diversity training. I'm stuck doing the things that they find acceptable. And the things that the CEO and, and the top management team finds acceptable are usually things that don't interfere with the existing career system the way the career system that they went through that they believe is meritocratic. And if you don't change the career system, you're not going to see any change. So I, I do think that sometimes HR managers and, and staff get the blame for the things that the CEO just isn't willing to do. So I feel like the, there is really a supply and demand. They are fighting usually for the, the, the right things, but they're not, they're not convincing top executives to do them. Uh, thanks to you all. This is really, really an interesting discussion. And I want to pick up on something that Valerie brought up and maybe, you know, provoke you to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and it's the, the idea of democratization, which I think is great. And of course, I respond to that, like, wholeheartedly. Democratization, yes. Um, uh, but it, it comes with the pair... Uh, the kind of conceptual pair of meritocracy that, that you're talking about. And I'm, I'm wondering about um, how you might motivate uh, democratization as a, as a goal. Because um, meritocracy as a goal has a very clear motivation and that's a profit motivation. So, so in the, the, private, for the private sphere, you can, t or if you're a CEO, or a resistant CEO, you can tell a story that, well, these people make me the most money, I'm responsible to the bottom line, that's what meritocracy does, it increases my bottom line. And I'm wondering what that, that kind of narrative for democratization might be that, that would push them in the world of self-interest, um, if we're if if we're just thinking about kind of squaring that um, as a as 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 maybe a um, getting over a, a hurdle to resistance. I'll throw it over to you, but the, um, I agree with with you, and the point that I wanted to make is that the frame of democratization is a powerful frame because it moves beyond the idea that um, s rather than saying that you particular set of leaders had a particular set of advantages that another group doesn't have, that frame creates uh, all kinds of problems. But a different kind of frame is let's just open up what was already uh, uh, available. So I was sort of thinking about it as a frame of, of, of how to move beyond resistance. So, so it's, it's talked about as a specific strategy around cross-training, around formal referrals and different chapters in the book, but I, I think as an overall frame, I think it ha has great potential, I think, to be uh, quite powerful. I think when, when, I, when, I, when we speak to executives about democratizing career systems, I think they understand it as making more open the career system that is meritocratic. So making each part of it open not only to, say, in the recru in, when it comes to recruitment, a lot of firms send executives to recruit at their alma maters. And because all executives are white men, they end up going to their alma maters and recruiting other white men. So, you know, so that's not a meritocratic system. So I, I think executives usually respond to democratization when it's in the framework of so that your meritocratic system is just open to other people. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an important, um, it's an important way, way to think about framing what we're saying. Um, we're, we're, we need to write write some shorter versions, and I, I'm. I, that that will shape how how we write them because that's it's true that it could be read the other way. Well, thank you. Very 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 interesting. Uh, can you maybe you started to explain in the discussion some of the reasons for the failure, and you identify either individual incentives or failure linked to the organization. Um, as you are a comparatist, sometime uh, would you go further than that and say to what extent what you are analyzing. 
um, could work or is explained also by some institutions in the US situation, or by contrast, you think that the mechanism you identified could also work in, in different environment? And that's my first question. Um, and second, um, what I, I like about this discussion on, on democratization is also, in a way, there are also a number of people explaining that democratization doesn't work so well when you have too much meritocracy. And very often we see some contradiction between uh, meritocracy and democratization. So could you go a bit further there? We could imagine that um, in a very elitist system, I've got the UK or France in mind, we are very good at, as you said, identifying through a very elitist system, a small number of people will be token and being extremely bad for the rest. So I wonder whether we could think about more general thinking on, on this issue of elitism, democratization, and meritocracy. Well, you know, I think the, the way Valerie um, described the book as kind of a set of tools that, but that need to be applied very specifically in different situations so that you, you need to look at what your, what your organizational problem is and then think about what kind of strategy might work. Um, I think to that extent, the lessons can be generalizable to other settings where, for example, you're having a problem with recruitment or you're having a problem with retention, or you're having a problem with the assignment of good projects, or you're having a problem with mentoring. The, like the principles seem to me to be generalizable, but to the specific situation, so industry by country. Um, I, I, you know, I think we have a very elitist sy system in some domains, like finance, um, where you know, you have to have gone to a top college you, to get into a top MBA program, to get the right internships, to then get a, a job at Goldman. So the whole system is not as elitist as, as it is in France, for example, but some industries are. And we see the same set of, of programs working in e even those, those industries that are highly elitist. Now, it might be that, that because of affirmative action education, which will be dead by June, we, um, we, we allow more diversity in at the, at the entry level. So it could be that, in the, that our, our, it, we don't really know what the racial composition of the elite schools in France looks like, at least because they don't count. They can now, okay. So, do you think it's worse <laughs> than here? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, they'll need they'll need other strategies. Okay, so um, we're a little short on time. We have a question in the back, and I have one question from uh, Zoom land, uh, and I'm gonna we're gonna get them both, and then all three of you take a last cut, and uh, we'll end for the night. Before we end, I, I do want to say. Um, Ordinarily, we have a book vendor here, um, and the book vendor couldn't make it tonight. And so um, the message is that um, bookshop.org has lots of copies, in, unless you buy them all tonight, <laughs> uh, which I think might happen. <laughs> uh, we hope that uh, everyone who's watching online, and those of you in the room, will, will pick up this book. It really is uh, a sharp, fun. It's weird that Maria and I both call this book fun. Uh, but it really is fun to read. I mean, it's really re rewarding and sharp and, and, and powerful so, and practical, too. Okay, in the back. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask you, in terms of policy and regulation um, in America, can you see any change from the previous administration to the current one? And also, uh, if there's time, because maybe there's no time, but... Just one question. Sorry. <laughs> we don't have time. It was um, diversity in university and also diversity from a religious point of view. Okay, sorry, we just, uh, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we do have a bit of a deadline. So um, we have a question from uh, Nancy de Tommaso online who says, what is most important in my view about the recommendation in this book is that it focuses on changing the interaction patterns and leveling opportunities for women and minority groups who had not previously had the same access. This is similar to early civil rights policies 
which were less concerned with whether people were prejudiced, but instead focused on their behaviors. But these policies worked only when goals were part of the requirements as they are in your recommendations. But as you know, goals may be permissible, but quotas are not. How important are the goals to having these changes in behavior to improve the representational outcomes that are hoped for with DEI policies? And are there legal issues in the current environment to setting specific goals against which outcomes are measured? So the way we want to do this is um, we're going to just go across uh, so that Frank can have the last word. Um, my um, husband is a federal judge for the US um, District uh, 3. Um, so I know the answer to this question because I taught about this <laughs> last week okay, that um, <laughs> that that goals are, uh, are goals are fine at least in this in this current um, uh, judicial milieu um, quotas are not so I think that's like the simple answer there's a lot underneath that and um, buy the book before I do. <laughs> Um, just briefly, there was one question I meant to ask. It's out of curiosity, and it sounds like the person in the back also was interested in your new work on universities. And you mentioned that we know the same programs backfire and work in universities as in corporate America. I'm wondering if the same kinds of programs, and we can talk about this later, but are as prevalent in universities as in corporate America. Um, well, universities generally have gotten on board later than corporations. So a lot of the things that companies did in the 90s, universities are just starting to do, like sexual harassment training is much more recent and it also backfires in a big way. A lot of universities have recently put in diversity training for the first time. There's no, our, our evidence suggests that it also backfires in the way that it's currently being implemented. So I feel like we, we haven't made so many bad mistakes as corporations have, but we're, we're coming along quickly. <laughs> and so <laughs> catching up with them. So unfortunately, uh, Hopefully, I'm hoping that university leaders will read this before they do all of the bad things. So, thank you so much for pa being here. Pa thank you so much, Eric, for the opportunity. Well, I want to thank all of you. I want to make sure we all buy this book and pass them on to our managers. All the, all the associate deans at our university should get a copy of this book. Um, Valerie and Maria, uh, thank you for, for coming to be such terrific panelists. Frank, uh, it's great to have you here. Congratulations on the book. Um, and I hope you all have a chance to talk with each other after we end. So good night to everyone in Zoomland, and see you again next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>